Welcome to In Conversation, folks. We come to you from Washington, D.C. My name is Ramesh Bhutani. And I'm Asta Verma. Ramesh, of course, the big news this week is President uh, Obama's nomination of Elena Kagan yes. to the Supreme Court. This is substantial, of course, because she would become the third woman who is nominated to the court. Of course, you think about his most recent appointment before this one, which was uh, Judge Sotomayor. Yeah. The thing with Judge Sotomayor, of course, was that uh, the two noteworthy points about her, she's a woman, mm -hmm. and two, she represented the first Hispanic presence on the court. That's right. And uh, with Elena Kagan, uh, the criticism about her has been that she doesn't actually have a lot of court experience. Unlike uh, Judge Sotomayor, there were rulings and, and things that she had done. Uh, she had a track record of her rulings, and you could debate those. But with Elena Kagan, she doesn't have that much court presence or court time. So she the has no is fingerprints. She has no track record anywhere. But at the same token, Constitution does not require her to have the judge's experience. That's exactly right. I mean, most people might balk at that initially, saying, wow, here she is, not very experienced. But on the other hand, the Supreme Court specifically didn't lay that down because they didn't want someone necessarily to come up through the prescribed chains and uh, really not have fresh new thinking on the court. But let's, let's talk about fresh new thinking. Five of the Supreme Court judges, folks, are from Harvard Law School. Three are from Yale. And the fourth one would have been from Yale, uh, but of course not, you know. Well, you know, you're talking the highest pedigree when it comes to uh, being appointed. This is not a 10-year appointment. This is a life appointment. That's so right. So any, any president that appoints, uh, you think, you look at Judge Stevens, and he was over 80 years old, yeah. right? You have a lot of these old justices that have served their time for 30 years in the court, some of them. So whenever a president has that special opportunity to appoint someone, they always want to appoint someone new and young and fresh if they can, because that leaves a legacy, the longest possible legacy a president can leave behind. That's right. So the criticism here has been, of course, that she is too liberal. The conservatives are already all over her. Uh, one thing she has been in the news for is uh, when she was... Uh, the dean at uh, Harvard, mm -hmm. she did not allow certain uh, recruiters on campus because of the don't ask, don't tell policy. She didn't That's agree right. with it, and therefore they were not allowed to come to the campus. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, decision is being questioned. You know, should she have been allowed to go that far to prohibit them from even coming on uh, to the campus? I think that this will be an interesting um, story to watch as it unfolds. I, I can't say that she's going to get through this, you know, uh, without a scratch. I think this is going to be tough. You think so? I, think I it's really be like don't that think. Harriet uh, Myers appointment, yeah. which was um, kind of ill doomed from the beginning. Harriet Myers was totally not qualified. <laughs> at least this woman is qualified. But at the same token, I want to tell you, uh, having never judged, neither as a lawyer nor as a judge, so when she's going to try her first case, she's going to find it's pretty hard to be a judge. Well, that's a legitimate concern. But I would also counter that you look at other justices, uh, William Rehnquist, uh, mm -hmm. most notably. He didn't come in with the, the experience either as far there are as... There quite uh, a few of them. There's yeah. quite a few. So I, I don't think you can pass judgment, but I think she's going to invite scrutiny. Right? She's going to invite scrutiny from the Republicans. They'll have one more reason to really pick apart Barack Obama's uh, choice here. But at the same time, as a woman, you feel good that, okay, there'll be a little bit more equal representation. Uh, it would have been nice to have seen a woman of color. But are but you going to root for the nomination? I, I guess I kind of have to, given my disposition politically. <laughs> but uh, I, I can understand the scrutiny on this one. Well, let's move on, folks. There's another story, and this one is about Washington Post particularly Washington Post Corporation, they own Kaplan University. They the one that does all the tutorials for the SAT and the LSAT. Yeah, and that's how it started. And then they went into the online university business. Of course, they bought some colleges to make sure they have accreditation and all of that. They have that. But this piece that NPR was doing about Washington Post was a little negative. The negative in the sense is that these uh, online universities, they advertise a lot. The advertising budget on uh, Kaplan was higher than the entire academia and the administration expenses. Wow. And the students, 87.5% of the students depend on federal government to give them loans 
so that they can study. Actually, so they get the money, but the students get stuck with the loans, unless, of course, they finish their education and they are really genuine about getting a good job. So in other words, you're using federal funding. And I'm guessing a lot of these uh, employees, federal employees, who are looking to do uh, an extracurricular study program probably use these types of online universities to get in, their master's after work and, and so forth. You know, in 2001, folks, the funding for these things was $4 billion. Last year, it was $26.4 billion. So you know that there are lobbyists out there that are pushing that those funds go to those people where it can do the most good. For instance, they go to the uh, shelters, you know, homeless shelters to recruit. Amazing. They go to the prisons to recruit. Yes, those people also deserve government help to find themselves a good job, but for the uh, taxpayers to pay $26.4 billion, where 87.5%, I mean, they're not the only one, by the way, folks, University of Phoenix, you must have heard a lot of it, they are almost at 90%. I wonder who came up with the idea of a 90% limit. You, you want know, to take a guess? <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to think of a positive angle on this. You know, with the economy the way it is, a lot of people just don't have the option of taking off work to go to school. Very true. Right? They, 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 they don't have uh, access to evening programs. They have child care uh, issues at home. The online option is a very good option. But what's interesting that you mentioned is that their advertising budgets are so high. That actually doesn't surprise me either because anyone that's in the online space knows that getting traction with any kind of ad online, uh, the rates are far lower than what you might get out of a direct ad or a magazine or a pamphlet or anything like that. So these budgets are extraordinarily high, but what's a shame is that all that money could be going towards something else, and all it's going towards is online advertising where they have really terrible traction rates. Not only online advertising, wait a second, they actually have live salespeople. They give them commission, <laughs> even though uh, you will not.